I'm Dan Langley, and this is the Manufacturing IT Podcast. In each episode, I speak with the key people of influence within smart manufacturing. In each conversation, we unpack and dissect all things Industry 4.0, from technology and trends to the ever-evolving digital manufacturing landscape. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Manufacturing IT Podcast. I'm joined today by Afna Ben-Bassat, the CEO and President of Platain. Afna, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. It's great being here. Yeah, no, my, my pleasure, Afna. And, and look, I was really excited when we came across Platain as a company. You know, you and I have got quite a few connections in common. And the more I've looked into the company, the more it looks really interesting, especially with the explosion of AI and all of the advanced tools for uh, smart manufacturing now. So it'd be great to learn a little bit more about yourself, a little bit about Platain. So feel free to, to introduce yourself, Afna. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, again, I'm the CEO of Platane. Uh, we're a software company. We specialize in AI applications for manufacturing optimization and automation. It's great being here, Dan. And, and you're right, there's a lot going on. I think, uh, you know, the industry sees a lot of inherent challenges. It's always been complicated to, to run manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in many ways, it's getting more and more complicated. Uh, you know, product mix is changing, a lot of movement. We see a lot of issues still with supply chain disruptions. Um, you know, it's very hard to get good people. So all in all, it's very challenging. And what we're finding is, yes, technology can help. And we're very proud to be part of this uh, part of this bigger world. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting space in the manufacturing. Obviously, there's the explosion of digital transformation and everything turning turning to the cloud or digitalizing most of the process and operations. But obviously, that's been accelerated and even exacerbated with the last kind of three or four years with, with COVID, yep. the supply chain challenges, the geopolitical, the economical challenges that the list goes on. Um, but Abner, maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit of a background into who Platain are, kind of a bit more about the company, the origin story, that would be a, a good place for, for the audience to learn a bit more. Oh, for sure. So, you know, we've been at it now for, for a good number of years and really from day one, you know, we, we are, uh, I would say a very good, interesting combination on the one hand of manufacturing people, uh, you know, knowing the problems, knowing the challenges, knowing really how difficult it is to to run a smooth and and, uh, profitable operation. And on the other hand, you know, techies, uh, software engineers, AI experts, algorithmic experts, mathematicians, and so on. So, you know, I'm very proud of this combination, understanding our customers' problems and also the ability to, to develop solutions. So many of us, uh, you know, either of us came from different backgrounds and and it's a good mesh. Now, what is it that we really do? You know, we try to help our companies become more efficient. Hmm. Uh, Yes, we bring AI and I'm always very proud to talk about it. But at the end of the day, it's about the business value. Uh, How can we help our customers uh, do a better job? Um, Higher throughput, less waste. There's a lot of talk now about uh, sustainability and, and reduction of carbon footprint. So it always comes down to, to business value and metrics. And at the end of the day, you know, we're seeing our customers struggling with, with a set of challenges that we feel technology can help, whether it's our capabilities around production scheduling or planning, materials, you know, tracking and optimization, the management of, of tooling or jigs, very fundamental issues on the production floor across segments that we found uh, we can help a lot with. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting space. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been CEO and president for you know, 15, 16 years with the business. So I guess you've seen a, a lot of change in the industry space and you know, companies may be more keen to adopt technology, but, but obviously wrap in the business case very closely to that. Um, talk us through a little bit, Avner, about some of the kind of changes that you've seen in manufacturing over that you know, 16 years in Platane, but, but maybe also before that, if you can. Yeah, gladly. It's been, first of all, an amazing, you know, looking back, let's say the last decade or so, really amazing. A lot of, a lot of dynamic movement, certainly COVID somewhere in between, really accelerating uh, the trends. Um, You know, digital transformation, uh, well, there are a lot of terminology that has come and gone, you know, everybody remembers industry 4.0, digital transformation, AI, IoT, and a lot of these cloud, um, a lot of these are maybe big messages or, or new technology evolutions. But I think what's most amazing is that to see it all come together 
you know, technologies such as IoT, cloud, and AI really finally coming together and, and, and you know, completing the puzzle to serve the digital transformation, to serve the Industry 4.0 initiative. And it took a few years to come together, but now I think it's clear to, to most people out there, certainly the market leaders, hmm. At this point, most companies see this as a necessity, strategic need hmm. to stay ahead of competition, to be competitive, to be profitable. And granted, it never got any easier, right? It's just become more and more complicated. Uh, we see this everywhere we work around the world, you know, Europe, North America, South America, Asia, etc. We see this across segments. Um, and uh, really, it's amazing to see how technology can help. Granted, you know, looking back, there was always a bit of hesitation, you know, what's this cloud thing or what's, you know, what, what's IoT and yeah. AI, really? I mean, are, are the machines taking over? <laughs> well, hang on, you know, one thing at a time, right? Uh, these are effectively tools mm. that can help us run better factories. And, and now that people see it, the next question is, okay, how do I harness this best? How do I adopt it? How do I manage the change? But these are obviously the next questions to address. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I found really interesting, so I've been in the space for the last kind of 10, 11 years or so, predominantly around <clears throat> that ITOT convergence and MES has been a big part of what I've done in this space. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I find really interesting is how the buying mentality, the project ownership uh, has changed. And so we're seeing many more CIO roles, chief digital officer type roles. Um, where would you say was the sweet spot for like a business leader within a manufacturer to, to use Platane? Who are the kind of stakeholders that, that would be your target demographic, say? Right. Oh, it's a great question. I think we should separate here perhaps, you know, the big from the small organizations. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, there needs to be business value, operational value. Hmm. With the small organizations, you know, the GM really does everything. And, and this is the person that, on the one hand, sees the challenges and, and feels the urgency to address them. And, but typically, this person, he or she, will have a lot of very good lieutenants that can help him or her in the process. Uh, IT, definitely, um, you know, planning, for sure, uh, engineering. And it's always a team effort. And, but eventually, how do we run a better operation? Hmm. When we look at larger organizations, you're absolutely right, we see Kind of this new role emerging um chief digital officer by the way chief ai officer oh wow i haven't seen that one yet <laughs> yeah, we're seeing that more and more but these are you know these are first of all experts mm. but they're more cross-functional and their okay. role is to really accelerate the adoption of these technologies uh per se really with the understanding typically of the board or management that it needs to happen mm. But a, you know, a chief technology officer would have a very wide spectrum of, uh, of goals and ideas. And, um, and typically, we partner with them. They champion the cause. Perhaps they bring us to the operational folks, but then we're back in the small business scenario. Eventually, there's a factory GM. There needs to be business value. There needs to be operational improvement. And at that point, the technology is, is not really the main focus anymore. Yeah, it's it's the actual sol solving 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 a problem. What yeah. is the what is the business case for the for the technology? And I think that's been something we've seen a lot of these conversations the last couple of years, three four years maybe, yeah. is where companies now are not looking for technology to solve the problem, but really looking at technology as a tool to be part of the problem solving piece, rather than looking just to implement technology for the sake of implementing technology. Definitely, definitely. I think. Well, I'll tell you. You know perhaps a funny story, but it's a true one. Uh, you know, I get this meeting and we're sitting with a very senior executive and okay, you know, how can I help? And, and the typical answer I get was, you know, is I need to increase my throughput. I need to reduce my waste. Fair enough. Let's, let's talk about it. And you know, this was maybe six, seven years ago. And the guy says, well, listen, the board told me to do something with AI. So I called you. Now, granted, let's do something with AI, right? We could do a lot, but I don't think that's the right approach, obviously. Yeah. So first, I'm, I'm glad to say we're not hearing that anymore. Yeah. Um, we're back to the business, you know, operational discussion. And I think the other side of it is that there's less, I would say, hesitancy, less, less uh, aversion to these kind of technologies. 
Yeah. By this point, you are not the first one to adopt AI. You are not the first one to go digital. And people see it. So the discussion with us today is not about what, what is this AI? Hmm. The discussion is how can this AI help me? What are the best practices in order to adopt it? The do's and don'ts. And here we're really seeing ourselves not just as a technology provider, but really as partners. Listen, we've had a similar case before. This is what we did. Let's look out for this. What about that? This is the right time to involve IT and so on. Hmm. So it's like really like any technology adoption. Um, you know, when people move from, let's say, paper and pencil design to using CAD software. Yeah. Uh, great. That was good at the time. Now it's definitely time for, for more. Yeah, and, and I think that's a fair point, isn't it? You know, there needs to be a little bit of time for people to get comfortable with the advancements and see other people working in that area and then be able to adopt. Um, talk us through, I've a little bit about the AI tools that Platane have and maybe some of the use cases to go with those tools because the, a lot of the listenership and audience of the podcast are coming from smart manufacturing industry 4.0, you know, all of those, all of this kind of like bubble area, but, but kind of different industries and working in different parts of manufacturing. So it would be really interesting to hear the AI tools that Platane has and some of the kind of use cases for them. Yeah, for sure. So let me give you a couple of examples and we can also then really connect it to the business value. Mm. So first for us, I mean, you know, I'm an AI person and, and, and we are an AI company, but, but at the end of the day, the customers, like you said, need business value need a solution that solves a problem. So to that end, the AI is, is under the hood, but let me let me give a bit of insight on that. So, you know, for example, one of our, I would say most popular tools is our ability to do production scheduling, production planning. So, you know, what's the challenge, right? You have a factory, a hundred workers, a thousand of them. You have dozens or hundreds of stations. You have hundreds or thousands of materials and tools and, and this, that, the other. And then you have your daily workload of hundreds or thousands of jobs and, and stuff to make. So someone or something needs to take all of that and, and crunch it. And the output is a workable plan. You know, who does what, where, when, with what, what time. And then, you know, by the time you have your plan put together, then you start your shift at 7 a.m. By 7.15, something, something wrong is going to happen. Someone <laughs> is late. Someone is sick faulty material, faulty machine, and then you need to replan. Now, if that exercise takes days with current methods, then certainly by 7.15, you're out of time. Yeah. So we need something that can solve this complexity quickly, holistically, automatically. Now, when we start, you know, and, and we've had these scheduling capabilities in the past and there are algorithms, et cetera. So where does the AI come here into play? Really the evolution of these capabilities. When we think about scheduling, first of all, there's a universe of, of solutions, right? There's really an infinite number of those. So how can we build a system that teaches itself, that guides itself along the way to ensure the solutions are always the best? Yeah. But the best for what? Because you, Daniel, in your site, you'd focus on on-time delivery. Yeah. But some other company would focus on, you know, maybe cost reductions, even at the expense of sometimes on-time delivery. Yeah. So they're trade-offs and somebody needs to manage it or something needs to manage it. So when we produce these plans holistically, automatically, et cetera, we actually teach ourselves, the software teaches itself uh, the broader solution space and then navigates it in the most optimal way to produce a solution that's right for you. Mm -hmm. But different situations are different, right? Machine is down versus material shortage, mix of today versus the mix of tomorrow. So over time, the system picks up more and more of these use cases and teaches itself for the next time, what's the right play. So this is an example of the technology creating something bigger, better, that was not available before. And, um, and that, sorry, I was gonna say, that sounds like a, a really fabulous way to implement AI in a really good business use case. My question would be then, does that still require on the human confirming whether this was a good action, a bad action, whether this was the right choice or not choice. So mm -hmm. it, it's still kind of combining the human element with the technology. So it's kind of like a hand in glove as opposed to the technology taking over, right? Definitely. And um, I, I love the word you use, combining. We use the term man-machine team. Ah, man-machine, so, I like it. <laughs> so we, we 
we definitely uh, say, and our experience proves it, that when you bring such technology, let's say to assist the planner in, in a manufacturing operation, then they complement each other. Hmm. And the team would do better than any one of them alone. The software um, is, you know, does what it does well. The person does what they do well, but together they do better than both of them, than either of them separately. We see that time and again. In many cases, the software will really take over the routine, the mundane tasks, will elevate the exceptions for the user, but then the user has more time to deal with the exceptions. Yeah, that makes sense. One, and the one thing about our AI is that it actually learns from the users. Mm. So let's say we produced some recommendation, but the user decided to say, nah, I have a better way. So we record that, we capture that. And if indeed the outcome was better, the algorithm just learned something. Mm. So next time the user gets a result, he'll say, well, that's pretty cool. Let's move on. Yeah. Right? And software evolves itself as a learning mechanism. And I think the, the other use case that I'm thinking of there immediately is that labor shortage, skills gap, the churn in jobs in manufacturing where you might have somebody, one day it's someone less experienced, less able to act on impulse or less able to act using initiative because they don't have the experience. So having a technology or tool like this, it's almost like a co-pilot, right? Someone giving that prescriptive guidance. Definitely, definitely. So first of all, you're right. Uh, you know, industry veterans, almost by definition, you know, if they've been around for 40 years, that implies their years from retirement. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we see we see that a lot. It's a huge challenge uh, yeah. to replace them, to replace their knowledge. And typically also, yeah, by the time you've trained someone, maybe they have other ideas. Hmm. So as a minimum, you're right, you use the word co-pilot, I'll, I'll run with that. It gives them recommendations to help them do a better job. But it also accelerates their learning curve. Yeah. And that's also very important. Um, I'll give you another use case. A lot of our work is around material optimization. So, okay, you have your inventory, and it has a lot of materials. Sometimes it's, it's trivial, you know, nuts and bolts. But sometimes the selection of materials from inventories is a crucial decision. Hmm. Uh, we do a lot of work in aerospace and then, or automotive, and they use a lot of carbon fiber material. It's time sensitive, it's expensive, it has a lot of parameters behind selecting the right material for the right job. So if the guy has been around for 20 years, he most probably do a good job. We can help him for sure. But if someone just joined the team and he needs, you know, he opens this freezer door, it's minus 25 Celsius, <laughs> there are a thousand units in there and someone told him to get four. Well, <laughs> which four? Yeah, now, yeah, it's daunting, right? Now, maybe, maybe, or probably they'll find appropriate material, but is it the optimal material? Probably not. Definitely not on the first day on the job. Yeah. So yes, by providing them these recommendations, prescriptions, not just the alerts, and definitely not just dashboards. We're yeah. giving very specific recommendations that the AI figured out. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating space really, Afna, because from my perspective, from the outside looking in, it, it feels, it feels, sounds, and, and almost is a no-brainer, right? Why would you not use technology to solve these problems? Um, because it, the, the use case is so clear. What kind of like pushback do you get or what resistance do you get from people who are maybe like not so keen, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. Frankly, it's, it's the usual, uh, I think, concern about change. Okay, yeah. What does it mean for me and for my organization, right? People are loyal to their organization. They want to make sure they pick the right tools. Mm. Um, and this is really where, you know, perhaps I'm less averse to AI. I'm coming from that and, and others are, but that's really besides the point. Mm. If I help you do a better job, then that's great. Yeah. So there's an element here, of, you know, like any relationship. If we spoke about the man, man AI team, there's a relationship to build here. And you need to you need to earn trust. You can't really demand it, right? Yeah. So we do it over time. We, you know, but our users see consistently that our recommendations are as good as they produce. We're not making horrible mistakes; rather, the opposite. We're making their lives easier. And they say, "Okay, that's pretty good." Um, you know, ten what is it now? Fifteen years ago, navigation apps on phones. <laughs> I'm never getting that, right? 
Yeah. Well, yeah. here we are. It's it's obvious today. It's a second nature. Yeah, I think that's a really good example, to be honest, because you're right. There is still some, you know, people that are preferring to use a map, but but really it's now a no-brainer, right? Who wouldn't choose Google Maps or a sat nav in a car to, to a distance? Um, you mentioned a couple of moments ago that you, you really served the aerospace, defence, the automotive sector. Obviously, I saw on the website there's a few other sectors that you focus on. Um, what it what. What industries are you kind of broadly in the most and, and why is it those industries that you kind of have found the, the kind of best alignment with your solutions in? Yeah, so I would say most broadly, we're looking typically into discrete manufacturing discrete. Uh, as opposed to process. It's more of a business decision. You know, every business needs to pick its, its focal areas. Um, and this can be anything, certainly aerospace, automotive, uh, shipbuilding, electronics assembly, you know, there's a very broad range of industries. Mm. Um, I'll add to that also, you know, let's talk high, you know, high mix, low volume scenarios. Mm. If all you're making is a million pencils a week of one type of pencil, there are a lot of factories doing something like that and they're making a lot of money, you know, Foxconn, right? Mm. Uh, but they've probably set up their line, tooled it, they're gonna click go, and they're gonna run a batch of a million, and, and that's it. Hmm. They don't need our help. Where it gets really complicated is those scenarios where there's a high product mix, different batches, a lot of changes, disruptions. Hmm. It's inherently very complicated and to plan, and this is where we bring the greatest value, whether it's around scheduling or materials or tool management and anything around that. Um, Today, yes, a lot of our work are in the segments you mentioned. That's also, I think, um, you know, part of, of an evolution of business. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you expand? But we're definitely seeing pull from a lot of segments, um, electronic assemblies, shipbuilding, automotive. You know, there are a lot of similarities where it, whether you're making an airplane part or a car part or a part for, for, um, for a freight ship, et cetera. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's very similar challenges that our technology addresses very well. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of a lot of what I'm seeing, for, so so I'm coming at it from a recruitment perspective out there, and we cover most different industries and most manufacturing mm -hmm. verticals. And what we're definitely seeing is the advancement in discrete and complex assembly industries yeah. has been an area that's really aggressively decided to adopt more technology. And, and I would say, especially since COVID, with the restrictions of people not being able to be on the shop floor, challenges on logistics and, and that sort of thing. So it's interesting to hear that, that you're seeing the same and that you're kind of feeling the same as well. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's very difficult. First of all, it's an inherently difficult process. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, period. Now, how do you do it better with not enough people? You know, one of our customers told me that their county has a 2% unemployment rate, it's basically zero. Um, and that's that's in the U.S. So it's it's very difficult, and so technology in many forms can help. And we're coming really from the software, you know, planning, optimization, management, uh, to come on top of their current systems that are basically managing data and workflows. You mentioned MES or or ERP. You know, these systems are very good at managing the data flow. Mm. You know, you do something, click approve. Someone else does something, clicks approve. Perhaps there's IoT input into these systems, great. But what are we doing with all this data, right? At the end of this, it produces a report or a dashboard for a supervisor or manager, and then that person makes decisions. So we see a lot of people making a lot of decisions, but how can we help them make better decisions? How can we coordinate their decisions and, and, and orchestrate them? And this is where our software comes to play. We're really focusing on the decision flows rather than on the data flows. Yeah, Abdel, I'm just gonna mark this. I've got a massive wasp running around my office and yeah, it's getting closer and okay. closer. I've I'm, I'm just paused, I'm gonna get this wasp out. <laughs> <coughs> okay, we're back. So <laughs> this, will, this will obviously be edited out, but that wasp was massive and it kept running right by my ears and I saw I was getting, getting scared. <laughs> Where are you based, Daniel? By the way, I'm I'm in London, in England. Okay. Yeah, so we finally yeah. got some summer, and it's brought out all the insects. <laughs> I was actually at a match. I was at the quarterfinals with Switzerland. Oh wow! And awesome. It was a lot of fun, and and the right team won. But yeah, you know. Anyway, don't want to rub it in. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, let me hit this, and we we'll get back to it.
Yeah, go ahead. So, Avner, with, with that, I mean, from one of the questions I was curious to see is like, obviously, AI, you know, AI in the kind of general population became a big thing in 2022, 2021, maybe forget exactly when, with the explosion of chat GPT and appreciate you guys and yourself have been in the AI space and really using AI tools for, for a lot longer. But I want to I want to kind of get you to look at the crystal ball now and go the other way. Where do you see kind of manufacturing moving in some of the kind of technology advancements in the next kind of three to five years? We, we've seen what's happened lately, but where, where's the kind of four, five, six years crystal ball type thought to have now? Yeah, I think we'll see um, massive, massive adoption of these tools and technologies up to a point where they wouldn't even notice that it's AI. It's kind of a no, no, second nature. Uh, you know, the chat GPTs of the world, the, the language models, LLMs, obviously are now, I won't say almost the common knowledge, not mm -hmm. even if not everyone is using them. Bear in mind, the younger guys coming into the workforce are definitely using them. Yeah. But, uh, but at some point it's going to become a given, like, you know, let's say Google search is, is very natural today. Yeah, I see that um, with the trends in workforce, with the trends of adoption from corporations, and with the maturity of technology, ours as an example, but others, uh, I, I definitely see uh, dramatic adoption, and this is where it's going. Uh, but we also see integration of technology, you know, speaking of ChatGPT, right, and, and the others. Um, obviously very good for conversation, writing text, et cetera, et cetera. But how can we put it into a manufacturing space. Mm. So it speaks English very well, but does it know manufacturing? Not really. Mm. Uh, does it know the ins and outs of our factory, Daniel? Let's say we're colleagues and I'm telling you, hey Dan, let's let's grab some coffee by the big blue machine. So you know what it is, I know what it is, but the chat GPT inherently won't. Mm. So this is where you see integration with our data models as a you know as a specific vendor knowing the ins and outs of the factories. We have the full factory digital twin because we're running schedules for it. And we integrate it with the LLM. And then let's say, Daniel, you're the supervisor. Good morning, Daniel. Uh, I, this is your AI talking. I've run the schedule. Looks great. You're on track. You're on time. Good luck with your day. Mm -hmm. An hour later, listen, something's brewing here in station number four. We're predicting a bottleneck. I can either reschedule the job or accelerate the material consumption. What would you like me to do? Let's do, you know, let's reschedule. Okay, done. Now, the ability to dialogue is in, is in the realm of, of the LLM. Yeah. But the ability to solve the manufacturing problem is in our realm. But you see here the integration, which allows for a very seamless user experience. And, and this is, by the way, we're already practicing that. And uh, it's actually pretty cool, but we'll see more and more of that coming out to the point where people are just, you know, talking to a system. And again, this team, this man machine team, mm -hmm. at some point, Daniel, you'll say, you know what, leave it with me. I'll yeah. deal with it. And then you'll go and then talk to whoever you need to talk to and figure it out. But you've really dealt with the highest exception at this point. So the overall operation is, is much faster, much more flexible, much more efficient. And you think that's close by in the future, a lot closer than you know people might assume. I see it as a as an evolution. Yeah. So this is not an overnight thing, not at a macro industry scale, and certainly not for any specific operation. Hmm. I think people are companies, people in companies are going to adopt it step by step, and you know in a couple of years they'll look back and they say, oh, I can't believe we did this. So I don't expect anyone tomorrow yeah. to, to fulfill this vision overnight, but it's it's coming and it's being and it's happening. And 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 that's a really interesting, you know, move to the next part of the conversation. But it's like where where, where is Platane going? Where are you taking Platane? What what's the future for for the company as well? I appreciate that. I think you know from a technology perspective, what we've learned is that. You know, the greater the automation of our solutions and the greater the level of intelligence or our capability of solving problem, the more business value we produce. Hmm. So from a technology point of view, we're pushing our products to do more and better. Uh, for example, 
instead of having you click auto schedule, maybe I know in advance when I should do that and when I shouldn't. Mm. And you know, that's already behind us, but that's an example of added automation. Uh, if today my algorithm, you know, solved that level X and tomorrow I improve it or it teaches itself to solve at a higher level, then we've made progress. Uh, so overall, we're looking to automate the decision uh, processes of more and more people on the production floor, yeah. uh, help them do a better job, but also orchestrate it. Because if I have just changed your schedule in machine 17, I also need to alert the materials manager to change their pick list. And maybe now I have an opportunity to maintain some tools. Yeah. So all of this it gets coordinated. And then let's add some natural language. Let's add some LLMs. Then we're all working. We're all doing our best. And this is where we're going. We're looking really to orchestrate the entire manufacturing operation. We're doing a lot of it today, but then to take it to the next frontier. And every step of the way reveals more, more opportunity. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting part, right? Because as you solve one problem, inherently, that just moves a problem down to somebody else, as you say, from scheduling to materials management or, or, or whatever it might be. And I think that's really interesting is how you then start to holistically help more people as well at a deeper level, right? Because from a from a help perspective, there's only what there's not much point only just staying in one segment. It's about the expansion of that. Oh, for sure. Even within an organization, let alone the wider industry. Mm. I'll give an example. It's actually um, it's actually one of our British customers. So we're doing scheduling for their day-to-day -day operations, which is great. By the way, we do it today at an incredible scale. We can run tens of thousands of jobs fully automatically and you know, really, really optimally. That's far beyond any, any human can do here. Um, okay, great. But if we're doing that, we don't only schedule this today or this week. We can actually run schedules a year in advance. Mm. So now we're suddenly not just doing the tactical operation, we're also looking strategically. Yeah. Right. What's your forecast? What are your deliveries for next December or next June? Let's run some simulations. When is it time to procure materials? When is it time to procure new equipment? Uh, should I open another shift or should I not? So now we're seeing the, the scale of the technology enables more use cases, supporting more people, and again, the overall organization gets better. So remember that same AI learning mechanism, which taught itself its day-to-day -day activity, is now looking three, six, 12 months in advance, and it's finding opportunities there. Mm. And let's connect it back to the LLM. Hey, Daniel, CEO of Company X. Mm. I looked into, your, you know, into our crystal ball. You know, in nine months, you're gonna be out of capacity. Mm. And in order to deal with that, you either need to get a new furnace or open another shift. This is going to cost you X. This is going to cost you Y. The furnace needs to be ordered today. The new shift needs to be open three months from now. Yeah. What do you want to do? Yeah, fa okay. fascinating, isn't it? That's, that's a fabulous potential benefit, right? I mean, imagine having that as, a, as an assistant. Exactly. And frankly, we use that. We use Copilot. We use the word digital assistant. Yeah. It's very, very practical. The more we can help you, the better. Yeah, no, I like that. And look, we're almost at the end of the episode now. And I just wanted to ask you as a, as a CEO, as a, as a business leader, there's going to be a lot of people watching, listening to the podcast that are budding entrepreneurs, that are budding manufacturing operations leaders. But I just wanted to ask you, maybe you can share some of the lessons that, that you've learned through growing an organization, through recruiting people, hiring the best people and, 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 and growing Platain to where it is now. So any, any words of wisdom on the kind of recruitment side of things and company growth side? Yeah, I'll find the best possible people you can. That, I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm stating the obvious, yeah. but that is this fundamentally, you know, that's our, that's our main asset, right? It's the people, you know, I, I'm not a manufacturing operation where you have your human assets, but also machines and inventory. All I have is people, mm. right? So it's, um, so yes, uh, the right people at the right place is, is critical. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on, um, complementary expertise, manufacturing people, technology people, mm. certainly a lot of emphasis on, um, on diversity. We're also a global company. So there's a lot, we see a lot of value in that, the difference of, of cultures, the difference of opinions. 
Um, and and that's we find that very very important uh, to and and it works. But definitely we put a lot of um, a lot of focus when we recruit and, and hire and train people. Uh, it, these are very you know very very difficult choices because we want to make sure we pick the best one. And uh, you know and yeah I'm very proud of the team today. Um, the other side of it is, you know, your customers, right? Um, listen to them very, very well. Uh, they know their stuff better than you will ever know it. So <laughs> what are their problems? How can you help? Are you really helping? Mm. Right? And, and so forth. And, you know, we look, we look at our different uh, success stories and case studies and our staff and the interaction with the customers, it, and if you make that work, you're, you're on the right path. Yeah, I, I think really, really good, good nuggets there, right? So be close to that customer and, and understand their challenges and pain points and, and really help, but also make sure you hire people that are best in class. But, but that always sounds like an obvious one, but it's so easy to fall into the trap of hiring people who, who you can tell what to do. But I love the quote, I can't remember who it's by, but you know, hire people that, uh, that are smarter than you that, that can tell you what to do and, and, and own their areas of the business. Exactly. And after you've done that, listen to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, look, Avner, it's been a, a great episode. Really good to hear a little bit more about Platane, but also your experiences and, and some of the value that, that you're adding to, to manufacturers. So I really appreciate your time and, and thanks for joining me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for another episode. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation and are a little bit more knowledgeable after the episode. If you're a fan of the show, please like, share, and subscribe with your colleagues and friends. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, just drop me a note on LinkedIn. See you next time.